he had to spread the love of Amida from his own heart to cover them. He had to love them in the name of truth more than he hated them in the name of the crime they had committed. And he succeeded. He succeeded in forgiving them and bringing them into a redemption. And they were definitely converted and became monks. So Shonen was a different type of man. He was a man more or less worldly in nature, impatient, dedicated, very truth-seeking, but not exactly by nature gentle or pious. He had many strange experiences and finally decided that he wasn't even worthy to be a monk because he could not even control himself properly. But gradually, uh, through the assistance of those around him, he achieved the tranquility of spirit, which made it possible for him to go on and become the founder of a great sect. There's something somewhat reminiscent in these two men and the Western experience of Peter and Paul. Peter would correspond to Honan, Paul to Shonan. These two became the great leaders of the Pure Land School, which was to have such a powerful effect upon the life of the Japanese people and of Buddhism in general. One of the interesting labors of the Pure Land sect has been its advancement of education. It has founded many schools, not only relating to religion, but to all arts and sciences. Buddhism has never in its entire history uh, been ob an objector to science or progress. It has never condemned a scientist. It has never imprisoned an intellectual. It has never committed any crime of, uh, that would be interpreted as frustrating uh, progress because of personal or, or, or sectarian bigotry. It has accepted all the truths that came to it. It has accepted Western life, Western science, Western medicine without a quiver. It has done whatever seemed to be right because the teaching is that it doesn't make any difference what these things are. Anything in this world that helps or improves anything or serves anyone is part of the very being of Amida. Amida is the one that makes all discoveries that help to advance human life. Amida protects the weak, it educates the ignorant, it takes care of the sick, it gives ritual and consolation to the bereaved. No matter what sect it belongs to, what creed it is, where it unselfishly serves human need, the spirit of Amida is with it. Call it what you will. There is no problem of trying to convert one to another belief. The only conversion necessary is to realize for the person involved that the good deed he is doing is because this good deed is a ray from the eternal life of good everywhere in space. So uh, Amidism has a space dimension that is very interesting. It takes us far out beyond the common boundaries of the universe and places at the seat of things a power, the power of infinite love, that this is the basis of everything. Now the intellectual will say it should be perhaps not just love, because love is very personal sometimes and is, is sometimes inclined to spoil the naughty child or to overlook faults and things of that nature. But then Amidism answers again with the same answer. If love is weak, it is not love. If love is capable of spoiling someone, then it isn't true love. It isn't the love of Amida, because this is the love of that which must be the eternal good for the one who gives and for the one who receives. But assuming that love might be regarded as 
deficient in engineering and things of this kind, then wisdom comes. But wisdom is just another name for the same thing. And wisdom is simply an attribute, an aspect. And love has two great uh, uh, aspects. One wisdom and the other strength. The strength of love is that which permits it to endure regardless of persecution, regardless of death, regardless of anything. Strength is the immovable foundation of reality. Wisdom is the, is the uh, willingness, the skill uh, to devise the ways and means for accomplishing the works of truth. Wisdom is the servant of love, not the master. Wisdom is that which rationalizes and makes reasonable that which the heart knows to be true. And wisdom also is the power which finds ways to put love to work in the world to achieve the good that is necessary. So Amida's paradise in the pictures and, and various imageries is a very interesting spot. It is a beautiful place, of course it would be. But the, uh, pa the paradise of Amida is not heaven. It was never considered as such, really. It has nothing in common with the idea of a place where we go into an unknown infinite and uh, no one knows what we're going to do after we get there. Uh, that's too abstract to fit into a plan. The Amidist is quite certain that the mere fact that an individual dies does not liberate him from responsibility. Responsibilities transcend death. They transcend all changes. For responsibilities continue until they are met. And the moment a responsibility is met, another one appears. There is no end to the fact that the human being is created to serve. And when he is no longer serving in the present embodiment, he is serving elsewhere. There is no such a thing as a lazy salvation. There is no one who is going to be able to experience the idea of departing from this life and resting forever. He is not going to float to heaven on flowery beds of ease, as the old psalm used to say. He is not only one more river to cross, there are many more rivers to cross. And the individual will finally discover that this fact, that there is a job over there, is just as much a reward and an evidence of love as it would be to leave the individual in some place of achievement with no projects, no purposes, and no reason for being there. So the Amidist to heaven, or paradise in this case, is a middle ground. It is the halfway house toward perfection. It is the place where the individual who is part of this life cycle passes out of physical existence and becomes involved in the consequences of his own conduct. He is also ultimately involved in the restoration or reconstruction of another body and to be prepared to go on with this material problem until he has solved it. Therefore, paradise is a vacation. It is not an endless state of liberation. But the paradise of Amitabha is a very, very nice place. The people, souls that go there are divided on the levels according to their attainments and according to their integrities. It is not expected that the child soul is going to be fully wise. It is not expected that those who are still imperfect but well-intentioned are going to be simply forgotten or punished because they did not make the superior grade. In the great principle, no one ever fails the school. He simply doesn't do as well. He may not be among those who gets the Phi Beta key right away, but he is coming along with everybody else. 
And in the paradise or uh, western world of Amida, there is an appropriate level of reward for every degree of human achievement. The most simple and sincere person is just as fortunate as the very brilliant individual who has accomplished great things. Everything is measured only in the terms of this accomplishment as it bears upon the internal integrity of the individual. And very often those who accomplish the most in the material world achieve the least in the development and release of their own spiritual content. Another interesting point in Mamida's paradise is that uh, over there uh, you go to school. Now this might seem as though it would be a very great hardship, particularly after attending one of our universities here. But in the old paintings, it's all very charming and delightful. Uh, in the western paradise of Amitabha, there are uh, jewel trees, beautiful trees covered with festoons of jewels, where beautiful birds sing, and where beautiful creatures like the deers of Kasuga uh, wander about, heavenly spirits. Here also are the angelic beings scattering flowers from the sky. It's very lovely. And under the tree is an old wise man sitting quietly teaching his disciples. They are all learning. They are all experiencing. Because while they are over in the Amida's paradise, they are again required to catch up something that they have forgotten. They have been there before, in one degree or another, but when they went into mortal life and so forth, the whole chain seemed to be destroyed. So after death, they go back to that level and continue, and in the course of their after-death experiences, they learn the meaning of the life they lived here. They become capable of interpreting it. And if necessary, the old sage is there to inspire them. He cannot do it for them, but he can try to help them to do it for themselves. In the uh, Buddhist system, no one can save anyone else. Each individual must work out his own salvation. But all of us can help the individual to understand these principles and inspire him uh, to live according to the law. We can do many things to comfort him materially. We can help him in his physical problems and he can help us in uh, ours. But the development of the eternal truth within himself must be gained through the release of the powers and qualities of his own nature. Now also in this uh, beautiful garden land of Amitabha or Amida's paradise of the West, we have the river that passes through which uh, occurs in our Western theology as the one more river, the Jordan, the symbolic Jordan, the, the, the river Styx of the Greek myths across which Charon ferries the souls of the dead. In the uh, Buddhist system, this is the river that divides this world from the other. From the, it is the river of energy, the river of the ethers, the river of the vital fluids and forces which form the invisible atmosphere of the planet Earth. This humidity, as the Greek philosophers called it, this something that we call the etheric realm becomes the river. This etheric realm also is the etheric body of the individual the body that must be gradually transmuted. But to cross from this world into the other requires the help of a boat. Now, we have never thought too much about boats, and yet the early church did. The papal ring of the ancient time, the fisherman's ring, always had the symbol of a boat on it. The nave of a church means the ship, and our word navel comes from the same word. In other words, the church is the ship of salvation, and the congregation, by means of this ship, 
is carried across the waters of illusion to the blessed security of spiritual strength. So the ship is there, and in the Buddhist symbol, it is a very pleasant little boat. It is, of course, built like a Chinese junk. It would be in that part of the world. It has two eyes painted on it so it can see where it's going, just as in the fishermen's boats in Hong Kong and Shanghai. And the, uh, the oars, or the rudder of the boat, may be Amida himself. Or if not Amida, then his beloved son, uh, Avalakitasvara, who has become feminized into the form of Kwan, Kwan Yin or Kwan Nan. In the body of the boat are people doing all kinds of things. And I think it is interesting that the doctrine includes the idea that most of these people do not know where they came from, do not know why they are there, and do not know where they are going. For them it's simply a vacation. They are outward bound. And in the uh, ship of the doctrine and many of the old prints of it, the, the old man sitting on the back deck with a fishing pole fishing across the river. This is a kind of a quaint whimsy, but it is more than it seems to be, because this ship, which carries us across, may be regarded as faith, it may be regarded as hope, but it is something that we have to experience as transition. It is the process of moving from this world to the next. Sometimes it's in sleep. Sometimes it's in waking. Sometimes there is a clear memory of parting. Others there is not any memory. Some wake up long afterwards. But this is the ship or the symbol that carries the life from this world to the next. And it is the body of energy fields, the ethers, which forms the vehicle for the transmission of the consciousness from this world to the next. When the physical body is gone, the etheric body takes over, and that is the ship of the doctrine. It is that which carries us to another port, but cannot go with us beyond that point. Also in the Armida system, we have the way of, of att attaining a certain meditational life. The Amidist has a kind of a mantra, Namu Amida Butsu, which means adoration to the Buddha Amida. This is something that is a song that uh, the devotees may sing as they walk along the road or particularly monks making a pilgrimage to a shrine or something of that nature. But this, this, these words stand for something. They stand for a continuing attitude. They stand for the fact that the heart itself sings. And this is quite important to their philosophy. It is the singing of the heart in themselves as they go along doing anything of life that they are supposed to do, they are constantly worshipping reality. Nothing that they do is trivial. Nothing that is done is done without a full spirit of insight and a full dedication. Wherever the person goes, whatever job he performs, if he cashes a check or puts a new soul on a shoe, as he proceeds, he recites the words, adoration to the Amida Buddha. In other words, all these things, everything that is done, is an offering. It is an offering of the human soul to that which is its own source and salvation. I remember in, in the late 60s, when I went over to Japan on one of my earlier trips, I noticed in the taxi cab, the driver had a little uh, sacred painting, a little sacred picture, uh, a little Ofuda, as it is called, a picture of Amida. And it, it was in his cab. So I talked to him a little while, and, and uh, I asked him, I said, is this a charm? Is this uh, something that you carry as a relic or as like as 
or a holy medallion or something of that kind? He says, well, I guess maybe it is. I said, Does, do you believe that it has power uh, to protect you? He said, no. I do not believe it has the power to protect me. But I believe it will remind me not to do the thing for which I would need protection. He said, I drive my cab every day as though Buddha was riding with me. The other. This is the another. He said, if I drive always as though Buddha is driving with me, I will be careful. I will drive honorably, and when the come comes, time comes to pay the bill, I won't cheat. Because I believe that if I do these things, and every time I look at the little, pic the little picture in my cab, it reminds me of my own faith, in case it should slip a little or something of that nature. But it is also the symbol of the presence of eternal love with me every hour of the day and every hour of the night with me in my the home in the, when I'm sitting with a sick child, uh, when my parents die, all these things happen. All these things have to be within the love of Amida. And uh, in this great faith and hope love is the secret probably uh, of, these, of this faith and why it has developed such a large following. Now, some will say that this is inconsistent with Buddhism, that true real Buddhism is a kind of an ascetic philosophy. Many have said that Buddha was an atheist. He was not an atheist. And he says very frankly himself, I am not an atheist. Others feel that he's very mysterious and has all kinds of magical abracadabra in connection with his worship as it has appeared in the tantric philosophies of India and Tibet. This is not the simple Buddhism of Gautama. The real answer to the situation seems to be that Buddhism is simply a basic concept of universal integrity. That the universe is a conscious, honorable thing that the universe is too honest to ever break its own law and too enlightened to ever make a law that isn't good. That all the laws that flow out of the darkness of space are laws of love. That they come from the great heart of life. And the great heart of life is the infinite, ultimate spiritual sun the energy of which sustains the galaxies and, and sustains all the clusters of stars and world systems as far as imagination can go. Borrowing from the Hindus long ago, Buddhism realized uh, that this was not the only solar system, that we were not the only planet, that we were not a unique creature or being in space, and certainly we were not exiles. Uh, in the great uh, Lotus Sutra, uh, in which Gautama uh, preaches to his disciples, at the moment of the revelation of the Sutra, the beings, the Buddhas, the great ones, from myriads of sons, rulers and guides and teachers of ultimate billions of habitable, existable spheres in space, all attended. It was a symbolic statement of the fact that Buddhism taught that every star was part of the great cosmic plan of infinite radiant love. It wasn't a question as to whether the star or the planet was inhabited by mortals. The planet or the star itself was love itself in its own nature, fulfilling some part of the universal destiny, that not a thing exists but is, has use, and in proper use is fulfilling the vow of its own renunciation. For the stars, like man, must swear 
that they will not enter the eternal paradise, the great ultimate of things, until all that they control or dominate or regulate can go in with them. With the motion of space, everything must move together. In the Amida system, the final paranirvana, the end of mortal existence, is reserved for those who have solved all problems and in whose nature and life karma has ceased. Now, there are a great many people who don't like karma. They take it very personally. They feel that it is one of the most common detriments to their happiness. But it actually, karma is not anything of this nature at all because the karma rewards good just as quickly as it is said to punish ill. Karma does not punish ill. Ill punishes itself. But it is the law of karma that regulates the procedure. Law of karma also rewards itself. But as time goes on through the evolutionary processes of things, the individual, by learning, by living, by dying, by being reborn, by contemplating and meditating the realities of existence, gradually learns not to make the common mistakes that have burdened him for maybe many hundreds of ages. He discovers the virtues of life. He begins to practice greater kindness. He is more thoughtful. He lives a cleaner life. He is more attentive to those values which are good. His love of beauty increases. His integrities are strengthened, and gradually, karma fades out. When the debt is paid, it's finished. The only reason why karma hangs on is because we have too many unfinished debts. But when we finally meet them, then the karmic responsibility fades out little by little. And according to Buddhism, it is karma that brings us back. It is karma that causes incarnation. When we're perfect, we don't live here. Many people have noticed the comparative lack of perfection. <laughs> the, uh, as soon as we have achieved freedom from, the de from our own mistakes, when we no longer compound the felonies of ourselves, then the karma ceases, and the individual gradually retires from objectivity as we know it to the higher realms of nature. When all bonds cease, when the individual has exhausted every weakness of his own nature, when he has attained all righteousness, when at last there is nothing more to learn nothing more to accomplish, and he has set in motion the, the wheels of redemption for everything within his domain, then according to Buddhism, he may retire into the state of Buddhahood. From this state, he cannot return to this world as a person, because in correcting his mistakes, he has also exhausted his personality. The moral rule being a personality is a mistake. It is a compound of errors. It is a structure composed of things that are not being done well. In other words, a personality is a monument of weaknesses, imperfections, delinquencies, or those vacuums caused by ignorance and thoughtlessness and self-centeredness. Therefore, the personality cannot attain perfection, because perfection is the final release from it. We will never have a perfect personality, because there's no place in space to put it. <laughs> but when we exhaust the personality, then we reach the point finally where we can no longer come back 
because the mistake that would draw, draw us back no longer exists. The, when this state happens, the bodhisattvas, according to the Mahayana school, leave one mistake. They purposely leave one shortcoming so that they can come back and serve. After the, this one shortcoming is finally met and paid for, then they cannot return. But they purposely leave something as a link between themselves and a world in pain in order that they may continue to serve, to serve by enlightening. According to the Buddhist concept and according to Buddha's own doctrine, those who enter the final Mahaparinirvana, or the extinction of self, which is the uh, troublemaker, the, then the, uh, the being is re reunited with life itself and continues to exist in life as life in a great reservoir of life. But the only way it can come back is through life. In other words, that which cannot be born again on earth is born again in the heart of every believer because it has now become universalized and is one with all that lives and becomes part of the sole heritage of dreams or ideals or hopes or aspirations which are to bring ultimate liberation to others. It's a fascinating story and a very interesting doctrine. And uh, we are gaining considerable information and assistance from it in, in our studies of abstract philosophical problems. The psychology of the Buddhist system is extraordinary, as Professor Max Muller pointed out. Whereas most of our systems are essentially founded in theology, uh, this is founded very largely in, in a kind of cosmic justice. It is not a system in which you worship primarily uh, by paying homage to something. You worship by releasing life, wisdom, and truth through your own conduct. There is no ritual that can take the place of release. And this release must be by intention. And this intention comes by dedication. No one is expected to be better than they can be. But each one is expected to be a little better than he might be. And this process keeps on going in the redemption of the human being. There is no theological structure. All goes back to a great astral theology or a great psychotheology in which the universe itself is one vast living thing. And the Amidas regard it as the Buddha Amida. And this great living thing in whom we live and move and have our being is also the thing in which what uh, this thing itself lives and moves and has its being in us. And we are gradually achieving the liberation of the Amida. We are gradually fulfilling the vow of Amida. All the world together, by growing, reaches the point where it fulfills the original vow namely that we are now ready with all other creatures to go with Amida into the Western Paradise. When this happens, then we have all achieved. But Amida cannot make this happen. Amida can only sit quietly. And through helping, through teachings, through pay art, through music, through contemplation, through meditation, and through all these self-disciplines to inspire the individual to finally make this ad adjustment and advancement for himself. The individual becoming aware of the great law, becoming aware of the eternal plan, has the right to dedicate himself to it. 
and through this dedication carried on through many lives, he ultimately becomes part of the liberating power. The only way we can pick this old earth up and put it back among the stars is for each individual to pick himself up by the nap of the neck and put himself back on the path of integrity. There is nothing else that will do it. There is no way that we can look forward to a time when the fulfillment of the great rule can be accomplished except by ourselves. Now, some theologies approach it differently on the ground that there will be a dividing between the uh, sheep and the goats and that those who do not make it will simply go to perdition, be, elim be eliminated, or will be passed into some other state of condition, and that only the righteous will survive. The Amidist doctrine can't accept that any more than it can accept a salvation which does not find place for a small bird or a little worm or an insect or maybe a tiny thing living upon garbage and corruption. That thing too must come to attainment. Therefore, in Amidism, there cannot be a division in which the good go on and the, and the evil do not. The good in man goes on and the evil fades out. But there is no way in which Amida can achieve liberation by casting out of his own mercy, his own love, and his own wisdom any soul for its imperfection. Therefore, the labor must go on until each one is finished. There can be no release, no perfection, no ultimate state except that of reunion with the perfect love of the Amida Buddha. This is perhaps a summary, but it may give you a slight understanding of some of the interesting points in connection with this faith, which may make, them, may make some points a little clearer to us. We, don't, we do not have to accept the faith. It has nothing to do with it. In fact, secretly and, and now more generally, it is realized that in the first century, Christianity in its original form reached India and that it was at the time that Christianity in its original form reached India that the great vehicle was created. In other words, it is now suspected that both of these things happening in the first century A.D. are not merely coincidental and that a very large part of the Mahayana Buddhism has been inspired, influenced, directed, and conditioned by contact with Christian principles. So we have another interesting point uh, for general consideration. Now I have an announcement I'd like to make, which I hope you'll listen to fairly attentively. We have on our program a lecture to be given here, I believe, on October 21st. Uh, let's see, this is is canceled. The uh, speaker was a person by the name of Barbara Taub, T-A-U-B, and by circumstances beyond her control, she is unable to be here. So if you were planning on this, uh, make the correction on your program. And now we'll be going, I'm going to give a little uh, time to myself now. I'm going on two weeks vacation. And I uh, will then be back with you as usual, and I hope that you all have a, a good time. Be sure and visit uh, Mrs. Olson's collection of pictures in the library. They're really outstanding, and I know you'll enjoy them. Thank you very much.